your number one son. All right, welcome back to Coffee with Coaches, episode three. We're here with Maddie Anderson. Welcome, Maddie. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I grew up in Waukesha, Wisconsin, born and raised, well, born and raised for my majority of my life. Um, And then I went to Western Illinois for my first three years of college, where I graduated with a bachelor's of science in psychology and a business minor. And now I'm pursuing my master's at University of Wisconsin Whitewater in applied kinesiology. And I've played softball all five years in my fifth year. So I'm getting old. <laughs> all this dirt. How old are yeah. you? Yeah, I'm, I'm 22. <laughs> okay. I used to was 25, Andy. <laughs> well, and Maddie, don't short short yourself because you did graduate in three years with your bachelor's so yeah I was just gonna ask that how did that work did you have prereqs in high school or what yeah I had a lot of prereqs going in and then my I don't know how I figured out the credits because I changed my major four times um <laughs> girl. but but somehow I ended up having like just enough credits so my junior year my third year um I ended up taking 21 credits in the fall, but that was my only semester where I kind of overloaded credits. Otherwise, I took probably 15 my all three years. Dang, and you got a minor. That's insane. Yeah, that well, is insane. Cross courses, right? Where some of them, like courses you had to take for your major that also counted for a minor? Yeah. Yes, that's helpful. So it was like some of them were like, uh, what are they called when they're just like the general education ones? So they, so they counted for both. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Like core classes. Yeah. Like the core classes and like the whatever music or you have to take a, those random. Sure. Uh, Maddie, go ahead. I would love to hear you touch on your recruiting journey, your high school slash recruiting journey, because you've, I shouldn't say bounced around, but you're not the typical like played for Beverly Bandits, got recruited kind of thing. So kind of talk about, you know, your high school career, travel ball career, and all that good stuff. Yeah, so when I was 13, I had back surgery. So I had scoliosis, and I had to have surgery to get it straightened out. So I have 22 screws and two rods in my back. And so that was a year long recovery process. <laughs> I'm only laughing because I thought you got in a car accident. <laughs> she told me that. She's like, yeah, she got in a car accident. <laughs> I'm like, no, I never got in a car accident. I'm so sorry. Fake, fake propaganda, fake, fake news. My bad. Okay, <laughs> sorry. No, no car accident. Um, <laughs> I just had scoliosis. So it kind of popped up out of nowhere. And then I had to get surgery because I had an S curve. And that put me out for a whole year where I couldn't do anything running, jumping, anything softball related, anything like that. So then 14 or I guess it would be my first year, 16 U, I started playing for a team that doesn't exist. It existed only the time that I was playing on it. Um, and it was called Banshee. And it was half Wisconsin kids, half Illinois kids. And we decided, hey, None of us are recruited. Um, at the time, I think we were all probably freshmen in high school, and this was before all the recruiting changes. So a lot of people were recruited already. And so we went on a few years and went to the big tournaments, went to all the PGF tournaments. We ended up getting a, my second year of 16U, ended up getting a paid bid to Colorado um, to the fireworks tournament. And so we were able to go there. We ended up beating the Beverly Bandits to get a bid to go to Col or to go, go to California for nationals. Yeah. So we were a good team, but no one knew who we were. <laughs> um, so that I just got a I just got a side note. Do you know what a banshee is? I just looked it up. <laughs> Me? A banshee is a supernatural being in Irish and other Celtic folklore whose mournful keening or wailing, screaming, or lamentation at night was believed to foretell the death of a member of the family of this person who heard the spirits. Yeah. Sounds and about right. I knew you were up to something when I saw you do this to your computer. I was like, what is she doing? Sorry, I just had to, I I knew it was something weird like that, but I just needed to read it. Um. So anyways, Banshees beat Beverly Bandits. Got it. Next. 
Yeah, nobody's. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> we're wailing, playing, wailing. We're playing women. all these like Mizzou, Tennessee, Florida, all these commits. We have like one girl committed to a rule with D3 Wisconsin school. Yeah. Like, <laughs> who made up your team? Like, were they all like just area kids? Yeah, basically. Wow. I think on that team, I think two went on to go play D1. Two went to a D2, and three or four went D3. Wow. And the rest the rest either quit softball or play a different college sport. That's awesome. That is, yeah. That, that, that makes my heart happy only because I used to play in that area, and there was just, like, Orland Park Sparks that were, like, yeah. D team. Yeah. Um, there was an Elgin team. I can't remember what it was called. They've been around forever. And I remember when I was like 12, I was like very tiny at 12. I'm still five. One. Yeah, I was going to say you're pretty tiny. Yeah. But like they just we were like, what are they putting in the water in Elgin? Like these people are huge. And like comparatively so to like my teammates too, you know. Um, but yeah, it's always or like Illinois chill, obviously. Like you always mm-hmm. want yeah. teams, you know. Um but when you were getting recruited that it was when it was post 2018 when it changed or it changed oh. while you were getting recruited. So it changed, it ended up changing after I was recruited. So I think, I can't remember if it changed in 20, did 2019? No, it had to be. Maybe I want to say the last year of it, because we just talked about this, the 2017 was the last, was when they changed it to the technically the. What do they call it lacrosse rule or something like that? Yeah, it was like September one of your junior year. Yeah. Yeah. But so all of my recruiting happened like pre that rule. So okay. by the time I was starting to finally like be good enough to looking at schools, like being a junior in in a high school, um, most of the schools were already all their pitchers, who's the first to go, pitchers are off the table. So yep. all the schools And you were a pitcher. Yep. Yeah. So all the schools that I was going to was like, oh, sorry, we already got our picture for tw- class of 2019, whatever, like, good luck. Yeah, we recruited her in seventh grade. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. <laughs> what was what was your dream school, Maddie? Like realistic. Oh, OK. I was going to say like. Both. Give me both. Give me like your okay. your. Give me both. OK. Unrealistic. Yeah. I always wanted to be a Florida Gator always I'm not even gonna lie I just I okay. always think... respect respect yeah okay yeah but um I never did send them an email okay when I was getting recruited I <laughs> never sent them an email <laughs> but realistically um I really wanted to go to Wisconsin hometown school wanted to represent my state you know but yeah I would say that was my realistic dream school so and at the state you know? tournament. Hmm? What happened? What'd you no, say? I said at the state tournament. She you said. pitched. Oh, yeah. I pitched. In front of Wisconsin. Yeah. 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 And then and didn't then call said, it. What? And then didn't call you. No. No. Yeah. no. Well, uh, that was what, that's, Yvette Healy was there, right? Still there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so at the time, that, that's what I'm saying. The reason I say that is because I saw her speak in 2016, and that was a time where she had like recently had just transferred from UIC or Loyola. I can't remember what. Uh, she was at uh DePaul. Okay. Or Are played you... at DePaul. Played, played at, DePaul. at DePaul. I thought she was at UIC or Loyola. Either way. Either way. Yeah. A lot of the Wisconsin, like she had kind of alluded to the fact that like there was just a ton of players that wanted to go there and she would spend majority of her money on pitchers. Right. And then everyone mm-hmm. else was like, Hey, yeah, we'll walk on. And then kind of just issuing out scholarships like that. Like she just had people mm-hmm. waiting out the door to play for Wisconsin, which that I feel like that creates like a really challenging recruiting environment for those who like really want to go. Right. Mm-hmm. And they, I think too, like at the time they didn't have a roster full of Wisconsin kids. Yeah. Like it was almost all, out of state kids which I thought mm-hmm. was really interesting as well yeah now it's like mostly midwest kid isn't it mm-hmm. 
yeah. oh yeah yeah no it definitely is we have a girl from gts that's there right now she actually was a walk-on and she got a, awarded a scholarship as a junior so big, big win coaster coaster <laughs> i uh i a girl i my family grew up with peyton bannon she's yep she plays yeah, i played with her yeah i filled in on chill a few times so yeah she's a, an athlete their whole family mm-hmm. yeah we oh. coached her cousin who plays d2 at uh indian or indiana illinois springfield okay <clears throat> so yeah we've we uh Anyways, sorry, keep going, Maddie. So where do we leave off? You were in California, you won a bid. And yeah. then and then, you know, we played the the big girl teams out in California. <laughs> and uh we spent the rest of the week at the beach. So That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so how when you were emailing, like who were you emailing and then who was giving you kind of like promising responses yeah I would say the majority so I emailed um Miami Ohio Ohio Green Bay Eastern Western um Iowa State actually I was talking to for a while and why are you rolling your eyes just like sacrilegious but it's fine (laughs) go Hawks I always say go Hawks but because you have to Yep. Mm-hmm. But so I was talking to those schools um, for the majority. And again, a lot of them were just like, we don't have money right now. Like maybe you can walk on. And then by the time your junior year comes around, money will open up uh, for scholarships, stuff like that. And yeah, I just, I wasn't really in a position to just walk on anywhere. And I really wanted to kind of earn that scholarship position and be a scholarship kid and go d1 i was d1 or bust i really was i would say the the most eye-opening one actually for me was when i went to iowa state i went to a camp there and coach was talking to me and he's like yeah like where do you have looks from and i'm like well not really anywhere at the moment like (laughs) and he's like not even like all those d3s in wisconsin and i'm like nope I didn't have any like D3 schools reach out to me, which was weird because wasn't getting looks at by the D1s. So, but yeah. I feel like just from experience of, and Andy, you can probably attest this too, is like, I mean, when I, when I would go recruiting at Dubuque, like I knew what I was looking for because from an academic standpoint, but also knew like, and I had a really good idea of what our conference looked like, like, mm-hmm. And ultimately what we could offer as a school and a coaching staff. Um, we look at comparatively. So like if you're to compare like Dubuque to Loris, like the cost is way different. Mm-hmm. Um, or like Dubuque to Cornell College, which is another place I coached. Like, like I knew what I was looking for at Cornell. Like, hey, do you want one class at a time? Do you want to spend $60,000 in school? Do you want to just focus on academics? Do you have a 33 ACT? Um, Where I'm going with that is, is like, sometimes D3s are really apprehensive to kind of like play in the D1 sandbox because we feel like we're wasting our effort, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny because I would only reach to a kid that was like a D1 caliber um, if there was somehow communicated to me that there was a chance, right? Mm -hmm. Like most time I'm cold calling people that I don't know even if they can play, let alone if they can catch and accurately throw a ball. And, and they're like, yeah, I'd love to. And they come on campus and I'm like, damn it. Like this was like, this was kind of like when recruiting platforms started to become a thing. I mean, obviously now it's a little bit easier. You can go on Twitter and watch people, but Mm -hmm. like it, it, I feel like sitting down at a game was only by invitation or when they'd hand out those books and it'd be like, all right, who meets academic criteria? What schools could I actually sit and watch and grab five kids versus one kid? Mm -hmm. That's the crappy part. Like, I feel like there was maybe people didn't feel like they were being actively recruited by those, you know, D3, uh, D2 teams, but they were kind of like when Twitter and stuff like that wasn't big, you literally had to sit at a game for an hour and a half to see what would happen, you know? Mm -hmm. Now that's not like a recruiting challenge. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so you committed to to Western on mm -hmm. a on a scholarship. Um, what? Why D three? Why Whitewater? Uh, biggest part is it was close to home. Mm -hmm. I was considering quitting softball altogether after I graduated, and so I was like, well still gives me the opportunity to play. I guess I have two more years. I can get another degree out of it. Um, but being close to home, being able to kind of continue coaching, stuff like that, where I could focus on stuff besides just softball was kind of one of the big pieces for me when I was considering transferring. And Whitewater has, they've always had a reputable program, which is- mm -hmm. In everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, that's what I kind of tell people. So I work in the athletic department right now. I have an internship and, you know, some of the admin sometimes are like, because all the, most of the admin, almost all the coaches went to Whitewater. Mm -hmm. So it really is tradition of, you know, tradition of excellence, tradition of winning culture. And they're like, why, like, why the switch? Like, what's the biggest difference like you see? And I'm like, honestly, I came from a program who did not win at all to a program who it was expected that you know you you win conference you win your conference tournament you go to the NCAA tournament like that's the expectation well and I think you know you you have a it's when you talk about it sometimes because I remember talking to you during your transfer journey and we can kind of touch on like the transfer portal and stuff mm -hmm. and your experience with that but I remember like talking to you when you're thinking about like, oh, do I need, do I want to play? Do I want to transfer? I'm between these schools. And I think you almost like go through an identity crisis of like, I just experienced, you know, it, a difficult three years in terms of the softball field. And, you know, and that happens way more often than people understand. And, and I think coach, you and I have talked about this. All D1s are not the same there's the top 1% and then there's everyone else. Mm -hmm. And you got some of those like dark horses of JMU, uh, uh, Cal State Foles here and whatever. But, you know, you kind of look at that, and, but you still did get a degree out of it. You didn't pay for three years of school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you got to meet some great people. You got to live in Macomb, Illinois. The thriving city the ever the thriving it's metropolis ever. it's it's you know people compare it to chicago i mean it's just yeah we would go to burlington for fun yeah, hey i don't blame you burlington <laughs> iowa yes yep. right yeah. across the river yeah it's like 40 <laughs> 45 minutes it's like the largest town over um so anyway so you spent three three years there you hit the transfer portal and at that time transfer portal was crazy like drama drama I was always just on Twitter like transfer portal update like it was just and it because it was like right when it opened right yeah, yeah it was like a year or two later I think yeah it was like the that's when they made the one-time transfer rule mm -hmm. yeah somewhere around there I don't want to speak but yeah it was somewhere along those lines where it was they had kind of like loosened the reins on transferring um I know you know, obviously, I feel like, and Maddie, that was a time too when JUCOs kind of like weren't the black sheep of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was when like it was okay to go to JUCO, and there was more likely, more of a likelihood you're gonna get recruited by more of a top tier D one out of a JUCO than you would out of high school. Yeah, no. So I actually, so at Western, my last year, I had two JUCO roommates. So. They came in and they were coming from the JUCO culture of no rules. Okay. It's okay. all softball. Yeah. <laughs> all softball all the time. <laughs> um, and so when they came to Western, they're like, oh, like, this is not at all what we expected, like, D1 to look like. Like, at the JUCO level, our coaches are like, this isn't going to fly at, like, your next school, like, blah, blah, blah. And they're like this is what we do here. Like we don't practice for 17 hours a day. Like <laughs> we just show up when we're supposed to, and that's it. Like, and so it was very much a culture shock for them when they came. 
But don't you think that that's why some of these kids who just are missing the mark to, from like, so let's say for instance, senior year, they have the, they have the athleticism and I would say mostly the, the mental IQ and the skill set, they're just missing kind of like those small little niche things that D1s are looking for. You go to a quality D1, you learn to master those things because you can practice 17 hours a day mm-hmm. and they come into these D1 schools and they're powerhouses and their maturity. Like Andy and I have talked about this, like the maturity of an athlete, like when you're talking about scholarships and what you're willing to take a chance on it, like a Juco kid's it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, and I think too, like <clears throat> the amount of playing time that you have under your belt, Mm-hmm. when you go and play at whatever division it is and and Maddie you can relate to this because you have three years of division one playing under your belt mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you go d3 and it's limited contact days uh player led practices stuff like that um but anyway let's let's segue back a little bit so you hit the transfer portal Maddie Anderson's name is in the transfer portal it was the buzz at every tournament a lot of coaches came up to me and they said, I saw Maddie Anderson's name in the transport. I'm like, well, why are you talking to me? Yeah, no, it was weird because I had schools I had never even heard of or like known existed reaching out to me via email. Like, Oh, saw your name in the transfer portal. Like you want to come to my school? And I'm like, who, who are you? Who I don't not sure where, where you're even located. I had to look up schools. Like, to see where they all they were I there was one school reached out to me they're in like the middle of Mississippi I'm like where I've never heard of you like so it was weird to have just like random schools reach out to me and when I went into the portal I was kind of I don't want to say set on where I was going because I didn't know if I was going to play or anything like that but I knew I didn't really want to go far um at the time so like the school's I had a school in Maryland reach out to me. I'm like, oh, Macomb to Maryland. I don't know if I <laughs> want to make that jump. <laughs> but yeah, so then I really ended up, um, I talked to Winona State and Whitewater and those were kind of like my last two choices. And I had previous connections with both the coaches just because of um, coaching and girls that I was coaching, committing to those places and stuff like that. But yeah. and. I don't know if you knew this, Andy, but um, I think the Winona coaches were high school coaches in Wisconsin before they became Winona coaches. Coach How Whip, long ago? Coach Whip played for the Winona coach. Greg? Mm-hmm. Greg has been at Winona for... Did you he hear it? 23 no, years. Whip, coach Whip played for him in high That's school. Cr- that's great. I did not know that. Yeah, it was like in the 90s. Well, I don't know how long he's been in Winona. I just know he has 800 wins there. So that takes a lot of time. I think 23 years. I think he's been yeah. there 23 that's, that's, that math's right. I'm, that's nuts. That's a, about right math-wise. You know what I mean? Wow. Softball world, man. So you go, you make Brenda's day. You say, hey, girl. I'm coming. I'm gonna be a war hawk. Mm-hmm. Let's let's win this ish. In your first year at Whitewater, how'd it go? What it was that transition good. like? What was the transition like? The transition was so different mm-hmm. coming into the fall. Um, you know, like at the D1 level, the second you get on campus, you're in eight hour weeks. Mm-hmm. And you're like, all right, here's eight hours, whatever. The second you get on campus at a D3, they're like, oh, where should we have a team dinner tonight? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and you're like, oh, like, we don't have to just jump in the practices, like, all that jazz. And then I guess the other thing is just, you know, we don't play fall games. We have one day where we play three games. We have an inner squad day, and then we have a day where we play three games. And that's our fall season versus D1 you play every weekend for a month and a half, I would say. And it's 20-hour weeks. It's like you're in season. And softball rules the world. 
softball is your whole life. You don't do anything without uh, it being on your schedule of things to do. Was that hard for you or, or was it almost like a relief? The change was more of a relief. I think when I was in high school, I definitely was like, softball is my life. Like I want to play, like I want the 20 hour weeks, stuff like that. And then even my freshman year, since we didn't really have a coach, it was still kind of more relaxed than a normal, obviously like schedule would be. And then when we got into it, my sophomore year, and it was like, all right, you don't go home on the weekends. You play softball on the weekends, stuff like that. It's like, oh, I'm mm. very not used to doing that. And so I really felt like I felt a lot better considering I was going to quit softball to go to a more relaxed schedule going D1 to D3. But out of high school, I was I thought I was ready for the hard schedule of D1. And I was like, eh maybe this isn't what I wanted all along mm -hmm. it's you... crazy how when that happens and you're just like oh man like because it's always about like what people say or like what you see on like social media and stuff like that it's like yeah they show you the good stuff like they're not going to show you like early practices 20 hour weeks study halls like stuff like that so yeah that study sense. hall treatment yeah all that yes I, I mean correct me if I'm wrong though like you go from a D1 to a program like Whitewater, as far as talent goes, like I would say that it's pretty equal, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking about, I'm not saying it's always the case in a D1 capacity, but there are certain D1s that I think are very measurable to D3. And and obviously Whitewater has flourished um, for decades. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that that probably wasn't as probably much of a culture shock, but would you say if you had to go back would you still go D1? If I went back, I would go Juco probably. <laughs> I'm a Juco. Let's go. I'm a Juco. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. But why? But why? I think uh, for me, it was the point I was at in my recruiting journey before the recruiting changes, everything like that. You know, I was looking for a school with scholarship money and I didn't necessarily have those offers um, at the D1 level. And so having not just a scholarship, but the like ability to develop, mm -hmm. I think would have been very Did you feel like you just pulled the trigger because that was your offer? You just were like, yep, all right, that's where I'm going to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, does it, what, didn't Madison College want you? Yeah. Sorry, right, we live and we learn, Madison. We do. <laughs> I just think hey, well, that's it, why that's why I'm good friends with the Madison College coach now. Yeah, he loves you. He's old. Hey, he's great. He's great. He's such a nice guy. Okay, so what about now? Like, obviously, you know, you you said you're a coach or were a coach before. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like, and I could be way off in this, but so like I had like a stint of so right out of high school, I coached a tenure team. While I was at the JUCO and then um, in between breaks out of the D3 and D2 I went to um, one semester I went back and coached at McKinney County College um, and it was awkward because it was kids I was coaching kids I played travel with like I left and I came back and those were kids that I was playing with right because the age isn't really a thing there it's not like you're, you're always going to find true freshmen like if somebody takes a break and this is kind of when like the JUCOs were like the redheaded stepchild of, of colleges where you weren't, there wasn't a ton of talent. People were, it was frowned upon to go to a JUCO first. It was hard to transfer from a JUCO to any school because mm -hmm. coaches felt like they, they were coming, like these kids were coming in and they hadn't molded them since they were freshman year. You got to reteach whatever. Right. Um, so now as a coach, would you say one, would you would obviously attract you we've identified you would attack your recruiting recruiting journey way different but mm -hmm. two, would you say and it's made you like a better player yeah I think I think it made me not just a better player but like just a better person more well-rounded person in general just because I did have to like kind of go through 
different things like at every level to that I hadn't experienced in high in high school it was great like I was like oh this is great I go to school I play softball like I got a good group of friends and then all of a sudden you get to campus and all of a sudden this girl's talking crap about this girl and you're living with this girl who you hate and then this girl is making friends with someone else and I was not used to any of that drama or anything um coming into college but just like the adversity that you don't realize like you even have to face is I don't know maybe that's just life but (laughs) well no like that's that's the first like that's you tell kids all the time like even like with the 18s 16s that we've coached it's like you you prepare them you try to prepare them more for that than softball like softball is going to be the easy part softball is going to be saving you mm-hmm. whereas you know you got girls I hate my roommate she's making a tiktok about me and like just all this stuff and it's just like yeah. I'm like we're trying to tell you like hey you're gonna yeah it's great playing travel bar high school with your best friends and you might have a bad day with somebody but like you're gonna play with girls that you cannot stand yeah. and girls are evil girls are mean yeah and just like saying to them like hey this is nothing like when you're gone and you're away from your comfort zone and now you're forced to deal with it. Oh, and then you got to go to practice and you probably had a, you know, a rough practice or something. Um, yeah. So that was, I'm glad you said that because we can talk about softball all day, but at the end of the, like at the end of it, softball should be the fun part. Yeah. Well, and you have to like set that stuff aside, right? Like, like, um, there's a couple people I've talked to. And I remember we always say, um, like in the military, um, oftentimes, you know, kids have come up to me and be like, Oh, I want to join the military, but I don't think I can get yelled at, or I don't think I could do the physical part. I said, to be honest, the physical and the getting yelled at is something you can control. It's the people that you're going to hate. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly like college athletics because you come You come together with people who maybe didn't have the same values as you, the same culture, um, the same upbringing. Maybe one person grew up in a very structured home versus not a structured home. And like the priorities are different, right? Like, for instance, like my mom always carries my bag. What? I have to carry my bag now, you know, or like, shit, I forgot a Gatorade. Like, uh, hey, Andy, can I can I have a sip of your Gatorade? Right. Like. And you're like, you forgot a Gatorade? Like, we're about to go to a game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think that that, yeah, for sure, that's the hardest part, I would say. Learning how to co- to cohabitate and work with people that, because tell me I'm wrong that when you are in a centralized area of Waukesha, Wisconsin, and then you go slightly over the border of Illinois, culturally, everyone's kind of the same. But then now take you four hours away from that surprisingly you could get that from going to McHenry to Huntley you know what I mean yeah no for sure and I think too like the other thing is not even from playing but from a coaching standpoint like Andrea was really big on uh cutting out or not cutting out uh like confrontation like constructive confrontation and I think taking that from a coach's standpoint kind of having to be that person with my players when something's going wrong when players are fighting or whatever it may be and being like hey cut it out make up mm-hmm. like and so I've taken that back with me to playing and where there's you know team dynamic issues or so-and-so is mad at so-and-so but no one's talking to each other so now the whole team knows that everyone's mad at that those two are mad at each other but it's a them problem not a team problem and it's like can you guys just talk about it like <laughs> I'm like there's no reason for this all drama to be happening like if you guys talk about it it's over yeah you definitely had to learn that and I could tell that I was so uncomfortable for you so Maddie had to coach 18s as a 21 year old Mm -hmm. 21 year old and um you know it was just like an unfortunate an unfortunate line of events so Maddie had always been my assistant whatever so I had to take one team and she took the other team only because she knew the majority of the team that moved up. So I was like, this will be easier for Maddie to take than it would, you know, for her to go down. Mm -hmm. And I remember a couple of the girls, you know, where there was just some just dumb stuff going on. And Maddie comes in the office. I go, hey, 
I think it's time you gotta go talk to one of your players right now. She's like, right now, <laughs> right now, and I was like, mm, if you want it to get better, you need yeah. to do it right now. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> okay. <laughs> and then she comes back. Thank you for making me. Do- I was like, I didn't make you do anything. I just suggested mm-hmm. as your boss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to go and talk about it um but then yeah so maddie is now teammates with a player so let's talk about that uh that's insane wait dynamic a- yeah a teammate so yeah so she coached one of her teammates last year yeah who's actually a catcher so i spend a lot of time with her being a pitcher yeah, yeah. um <laughs> but no i think I think at first it was a little weird just because it's a different dynamic because obviously I have my coaching hat Mm -hmm. and then I take it off and I have my, you know, how I am as a player, which Mm -hmm. is very completely different. Um, For me, it is. And so she's like, wow, I didn't know you were like this. And I'm like, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? She's like, no, it's just so different. Like, it's weird not having you as my coach, but having you like as a teammate, like, I'm like, yeah, it's a little weird too. Like I can, you know, swear in front of you. Like, oh, you still do that. Okay. <laughs> but, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's a different yeah, setting. Yes. Like, it's just, it's, there's, it's there's different. different boundaries. There's the boundaries are gone. Yes. No, no, yeah, I totally, the, I, yeah. I totally get that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Coach, I remember, I, I remember, I remember one tournament, they were like, Maddie. I go, who are you talking to? I said, that is Coach Maddie to you. I don't care how old you are. Yeah. No. And that's what she would always joke. She's like, we're going to be teammates soon. I said, yep, yeah, well, we're. St- I'm still your coach. I yeah. said, I'm still your coach till the end of the summer. But yeah. <laughs> mind you, she's probably going to be the starting catcher too. So it's legit like they're together all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that it was interesting. But now it's like. For me, it's completely normal. I hope for her, it's completely normal too. But <laughs> where those walls are kind of broken down and we see each other just as teammates now. Mm-hmm. It's the coaching dynamic is hard. Um, you know, like like Andrea alluded to, like you know, like some of my kids were like, hey, you know, what what do we call you? And, and I was like, it should be, it should be coach to start. Then you, you earn that res- you earn that respect to call me something else. Um, what I've learned though is, um, and and Andy and I kind of talked about this before, was like, there's gonna be some of those kids, like I have one kid that says, yes, ma'am. Every, every time it's, I say something, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. And that's a choice of hers, right? Um, and I feel like it's a term of respect and that's kind of how she's grown up. Um, and there's some kids that call me coach. There's other kids when they're trying to get my attention, they call me Ashley. And I let them flex to a capacity. Um, one, because I feel like the authoritativeness, if you will, is like already implied, right? Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting because I mean, even when I was coaching Andrea, like I had just graduated college. I was 23. And you were what, 20? Yeah, no, I was probably 19 still. So. Well, you had gone. You to, yeah, but still, it, there's still, it's a very close age, mm-hmm. right? You, I mean, when did you, when did you graduate eighth grade? Andy? Me? Yeah. When did I graduate eighth grade? Or uh, when? 2008. We... Okay, so basically, yeah. So, I mean, we wouldn't have seen each other in the high school like at a high school season but it almost could be similar to like you being a freshman me being a senior and then oh yeah no for sure yeah but the dynamic is hard like especially as GA that's why I feel for GAs and young coaches because one you've you've played that player role already but then you haven't figured out the coaching role and like I I struggle with the same challenges as you did Maddie where I was like it was either like when I coached Andrea, it was like this, I had to assert dominance because it felt like three, four years was not a big enough gauge, age gap. Um, and the, probably a lot of them were like, damn, she's like always got a chip on her shoulder. You know? Are you saying that I was disrespectful? Is that what no, you're saying? No, no, no. No, what I'm saying is, is like, I felt you like- were I, so disrespectful. I know. Maybe, 
Well, I'm sure Andy could tell you a story about one time where where she was. I I and I think we told this in the first episode was that she essentially there was like a, a tweener between the middle infielder and Andy and our middle infields secured the ball, but I was like, Andy, you're running in. That's your ball. And she was like, but she caught it. And I was like, I was having a bad day. <laughs> I had a bad day. Okay. And I'm sorry. And I apologized. And then I cried and yeah. I'm sorry. And I've never done it since. So when girls do that to me, I'm like, I see you. And you must be having a bad day. Yeah. Yeah, but I but you you get what I mean. Like you almost have to either like you have to like be the bitch or you have to be a friend. Like there's really no in between, you know, mm -hmm. in the beginning, you know. Yeah. I feel like and I will say one of my favorite things, probably one of my favorite people to ever coach with is Maddie because she lets me be me and then I can I can safely look at her and be like, Was I wrong or was I right? And she's like my calm and she also pitch calls which is not my jam. Yeah. And I think that's so true that like good cop, bad cop, like I know I was the bitch and I'm okay with that. Whereas everyone was like Maddie. And then when Maddie had to leave me, I had to say like, Maddie, like you have to be the bitch now. Like, yeah. And yeah. that's naturally hard. The only time I've seen you that way is when you're pitching, right? Yeah. But outside of that, that's just not in your nature at all. Not even a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you struggle. I feel like I've always said like a head coach is always as good as its assistants. It only is as good as this. Mm -hmm. But also the assistant is more of like the buffer. Like mm -hmm. the head coach is a hammer and the assistant is a buffer. And it's really hard. Like it's a lonely world there, right? Like, yeah, you have your assistant, but it's lonely because oftentimes the kids feel more apt to to going to the assistant because they don't have to be the hammer you know what I mean yeah. so yeah, they kind of can share their own opinion without it having to look <laughs> a look exactly like Andy's look to be like did that just come out of your mouth <laughs> do you have this we had, a, we had a lot of windshield time we had a lot of windshield time and a lot of tournaments and a lot of hours and like I said um whatever Maddie chooses to do after she graduates she's gonna be really good at it because she's just a good kid wow thanks Andrea I've told you this it might have been I... after a couple of drinks but I've told you this <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so Maddie um what would you what sort of advice would you have for people who have the d1 or bust mentality keep your options open would be my first one um and I guess really like dig in at why you want to go to division one because obviously with social media it's like oh I committed here like isn't that cool of me like look what I did and I think a lot of people with social media kind of want the look of I'm going d1 without really understanding what it's like to go division one um so that would be my main thing. Uh, but I guess visit as many campuses as possible too. Because I went to a few like division one campuses where I was like, no, I do not want to go here. Like it was either like too centralized or it was too big or whatever the case may be. And, or that I didn't like the surrounding town of it, I, which sounds funny since I landed in Macomb, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh just stuff like that that you don't really think about like oh how long does it take to get to the nearest target like mm -hmm. is it is it in the town or do you have to take a road trip there just dumb stuff that you don't think about when you're in high school and you actually have to go live on your own and be a human and not have mommy and daddy to rely on yeah you know, it's funny, um, you know, like in my full-time job, we oh, it, people are very amazed by, because we always talk about, hey, like don't have the D1 or bus mentality and it's not about your mom wearing the sweatshirt in the mall, right? Like, and, and, you know, like statistically what we try to tell kids is that like, you know, 
if there's 1700 colleges, which there are around, right? 1700 colleges that you can go and play softball at and 70% of them are east of Mississippi. So one, if you don't wanna go on the East Coast or in the Midwest, that really narrows down your chances, but 300 of them being D1. So 82% of your, your opportunity to play softball is lower than D1. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like when you throw those like statistics out at people, they're, they're actually like amazing, right? Um, and I, I struggle, like I'm super glad you said um, what you did was because I struggle with the idea that um, kids like don't know that, right? And and if it's more of like this, this uh, throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks, who's going to give me the most attention? And I try to tell kids like, college is not going to invest in you if you don't invest. Mm -hmm. well, we're past the whole point of colleges seeking out people because there's enough talented kids to fill a roster or for them to be like athletic enough to be like, you're going to be great at your junior year. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's the other thing too, is wherever some kids do want to develop those first, that freshman, sophomore year, and then have the opportunity to start their junior year. But those people that just want to play, you got to be really good to play D1 as a freshman. You and, heard it here, folks. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you heard it here. Not like we've been saying that for years. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was I going to say? So what do you, what do you, your, your final year, your final year of playing softball, you're going to have yeah. two degrees in five years. What, and you guys, coach, they haven't even played yet. They haven't even started their season yet. Did that at Bluff when I was at Bluffton, we didn't start until the third week in March. Oh my God. Bye. Well, we, Any... we practiced from start January yeah. forward, but sure. we didn't play a game until the third week of March during spring break. That's nuts. I'm so sorry. But what I'm getting at is how, how are we feeling going into Florida? Your, your spring break trip heading to Florida. I think you guys play Tufts, which is nationally ranked. You guys play mm -hmm. Trine this year? Uh, we don't play Trine. We play Milliken. Milliken nationally ranked. Um, how how are we feeling? How are we feeling about the team this year? I'm feeling good. You know, people are asking me like, "Oh, it's gonna be so nice to get to Florida, like get outside." I'm like, "We've been outside since we were outside in January. The last week of January, we were practicing out on our football field. So yeah, it's kind of nice that this year we haven't been stuck in the gym and we've been able to get outside, get reps on." not just the turf, but on our own dirt field, which is insane in Wisconsin. That yeah. doesn't happen. But um, no, I'm I'm very excited. We have a good high strength of schedule this year and really going to face a lot of tough competition, which hopefully going into postseason will really help us. Um, we have a lot of eight out of our nine starters last year are back. So we have a lot more experience on the team and Got a few good freshmen in there. Um, yeah, I don't know. Looking forward to it. This is a good team. We we focus so much on team bonding, like throughout the entire year, and like we are just so tight knit, such close team that even if even if we don't out talent teams, we'll we'll all play some teams because of how close we are. Did you guys go to postseason last year? Uh, we made it to the first round of regionals. Uh, do you guys ever come across Linfield? No. Oh, they went, it was Co College and Linfield in the, in the championship. They lost to Co. Co was in their regional. I have a former player that pitches at Linfield. Um, you know, Alma and Transylvania are always normally pretty good D3s as Transylvania well. Transylvania yeah. was in their regional. Yeah, Transylvania was in the, the, the conference, the Heartland Conference when I played at Bluffton. We were in our conference. And then um, my coach, she always paired us up with Alma as well because that was her alma mater. But yeah, trying Alma, Transylvania, they always give you a game for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm excited. No, and I think above all else, I, I'll say this too as just like a, a finalish thought, like make connections with, every single person that you meet, whether it's just talking to them about their life, sharing about your life, whatever it may be, because 
you learn some pretty cool stories, but you get really close with people really fast when you're actually willing to open up and, you know, bond with, especially the girls on either side of you. So I would say that as well. I think that's the hardest part, you know, Mm -hmm. being vulnerable to your teammates, but also figuring out where you might be a different, a part of either a, a different social class, be a different or culture or see a, a different social group. But when you get on the field, you can, you can high five and be each other's best friend. And then you can go separate ways after you walk off the field. That's, mm-hmm. that's really fantastic. Yeah. And Andy, any final thoughts? No, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Maddie play. And um, I think, you know, it's kind of, uh, we're closing in on a chapter that, you know, I, I know a lot of people are, you know, a big fan of you and I've known you for a long time. I've only seen your journey. It's not a lot. I know you more off the field probably than I do on the field. So, um, I'm excited, especially now to have more time to watch you guys play and, you know, hopefully, hopefully make that postseason run. That's right. Yeah. Well, rock on Maddie. It was really great having you on and thanks for all your nuggets. Cause it's great to hear it from the horse's mouth. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right, you guys take care. Don't want-